It's been lovely that he's had a relationship with Nimbin, and it's third or fourth time you've fourth, come here and talked. Fourth, fourth time he's come here and talked. And just, you know, I'm just thrilled that we get a place in his itinerary, which is, you know, global now. So a little old Nimbin. Anyway, it's really special. We're really grateful you're here. And John Jiggins for bringing him here, and Dave for the Bush Theatre. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What can I say? You said it looked like you guys know more about me than I'll ever know about you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sort of completely embarrassed. I sort of stand here in front of you with a bag on my head. <laughs> um, but, Julian, you, you know, things are looking up a bit. The tide's risen. In Australia, we seem to be at the apogee, apogee at the height of our work now that we've done. The Prime Minister is making her declarations of support carefully worded and yeah, I think and uh, oh dear. And the um, and the Foreign Minister invites me to meetings uh, and uh, says that they've made representations to the United States. The general what can I say about this? What rough beast it's our come round at last slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. In 1948, an Australian, Herbert Bear Evatt, established the United Nations. He also, at the same time, established the Universal Declaration of Human Rights hand in hand with Eleanor Roosevelt. An Australian started the United Nations, was the first president, and also was co-author of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In 1973, this is a magnificent civil artifact brought into being by an entire world shocked, shocked over the destruction of 40 countries and 100 million souls during the World War. It made for a relationship between states through laws. If you have problems and interests, sort them out through a body of laws, simultaneously with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There were rights that were non-derogatable, which I and given to me that they can't be taken away from you. The first time in history, thousands of years go by, and we established this, and an Australian did it. 1958, the Conventions of Asylum were written. In 73, Christmas time, 74, as Australia. <laughs> Gone, Dave. Oh. Oh. Might be a battery issue. Yeah. Oh. Oh. A battery issue. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, Just God, talk. Okay. Uh, in in 73, 74, Christmas, Australia took those conventions of asylum uh, to the United Nations General Assembly and they were approved with only 16 abstentions. That was Australia under Whitlam. The conventions of asylum, because we know that on occasion states become insecure, and in their insecurity they depredate on people who they suspect are causing that inse insecurity. In '73, there were 10,000 people in asylum in Santiago uh, under Pinochet. Julian was an asylee. To become an asylee, it's a, a matter of being declared an asylum, sorry, declared an asylee by a body of people from the United Nations. Equally, to be removed, it's a, a process, which didn't happen in Julian's case. 
The conventions, the Geneva Conventions were codified and adopted into the United Nations. All of these magnificent civil artefacts, in the case of Julian Assange, being emblematic of their deterioration and a collapse into barbarity, which we can feel that's happening in the world. Yeah. Feel, we actually feel it. We gather together and shake our heads over it and we elect a government which I characterize in this, as an Assange government because every single successful member of that government was elected on an Assange platform as were all of the Greens, all of the Teals, and two independents. 88% of the Australian population in the last poll want Julian brought home. These are important things because not the people want or know Julian or want actually Julian, but they want this emblem of injustice to be undone. Mm. Now, Julian Assange, he grew up, just went to school up the road. The headmaster died last year, which I could, uh, King, his name was King. He died last year, Julian's headmaster, when he went to school up the road. The point I want to make by saying that is that Julian grew in the soil of our society here. And that's that quality that's attractive in Julian is a creation of us. That's what we are like. We're also like Gough Whitlam, who brought to the United Nations the Conventions of Asylum. We're also like Herbert B. Evans, who established the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the first president of the United Nations, and put the United Nations together in a fashion that the small countries had representation, otherwise the big countries in the UNGA, the United Nations General Assembly, would have preferential votes. But in the UNGA, it's the, United, the General Assembly, each gets a vote, little or big. I think these things are important to gather into the soul and the realisation that we produce in the soil of our society such qualities. And I only, you know, forgive me just nominating Julie and a couple of others, but I bumped into Leonid the other day. He was sitting in a, I was doing a speech for some occasion or other, which I can't remember. And he was sitting in the audience. Another creation of the soil, a man of great quality. We have amongst us as friends, Graham Dunstan, who has been on the peace trail now for 50 years in peace bus, erecting, uh, uh, he, for, for us, you know, for the science things, he does posters and banners for us. But for 50 years, he's on the trail of bringing the awareness that the possibility of Australia to be strong but peaceful. He was a Duntroon uh, officer, which is, uh, trains Australian uh, military officers. David McBride whistleblower, 39 murders in Afghanistan, another Australian. He's a dear friend. We'll be speaking together tomorrow on a program. Bernard Collery fought for Citizen K, we don't know his name, over the suborning by Alexander Downer of uh, witnesses and over the uh, listening in on the negotiations of a newly created uh, country, East Timor. Ch 
cheating. Cheating people. We are rich here. Cheating people who have nothing. That was the aspect of Alexander Downers and Howard Govan. Stealing from people who have got nothing. And we have men like Bernard Collery, Witness K, David McBride, Herbert Bear, Everett Goff, Whitlam, Moss Cass. Moss Cass brought into being the Medicare for Australia. One of the first in the world. Fabulous system. Of course it needs uh, what they call reform now, but it only needs a certain changes to its distribution but a magnificent artefact of this society. So I just uh, want to give a feeling of the quality, even though we all dress casually. We look at each other in the street and we see casual, somewhat careless, um, people without depth of civility, you know, like a, Good morning, how do you do? How are you today? When you go into the shop, in, in, Europe, in France in particular, they always say, good morning, how are you? And then make their order. But we could go into a, a shop and say, well, can I have one of those, please? Um, so we think that we're less than those societies that articulate the civilities between people but it's only it's only surface we are substantial in every way casual but substantial and a part of that substance has kept this small oasis here called Nimbin going these 50 years and it's an example to all of them. Come, I come here and the, all of the burdens of, and tensions of city life where you, you, know, you go into Melbourne, it's an extraordinary place and you see 300 gigantic buildings with all the windows in each building exactly the same which reduce your humanity in their bureaucratic intensity of having everything the same and being great big things, you know, bigger than the sky, they reduce your humanity to about that big. You become insignificant. But you walk down the street here and your significance is felt, your significance, personal significance, is felt in the heart because it's all detailed. You know, there's little things everywhere. There's graces here. It's like in India, they put out, in Bali, Hindu, they put out a little dish with some food in it for the gods. It's a grace. Mm -hmm. And when you walk down the street here, there are many graces. Yeah. People have made effort to give you a small <coughs> moment of humanity. That's very sweet to me. Anyway, I got off the track a bit, but <clears throat> essentially, in the case of Julian Assange, he is emblematic of a decline of civility between people and nations, and nations and their peoples. Emblematic. And I, I can just, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll illustrate that and then we'll get off this thing. Um, so, one of the charges against Julian is uh, computer intrusion in Iceland. So the FBI got uh, permission from the uh, Icelandic Minister for Justice and then went over there and they said to this chap Thordarsson, if you make this testimony, we'll uh, give you immunity of prosecution. Now this bloke, he was... Uh, a convicted paedophile and a convicted fraudster. He made the testimony that they wanted. So they laid that charge against Julian and took that charge <coughs> to London to extradite Julian to the United States. 
So that's an offence, an alleged offence in Iceland by an Australian taken to a court in the United Kingdom by the United States to extradite Julian to America. It's mad. The evidentiary basis for that doesn't exist. So that sort of a uh, you know, that sort of evidentiary quality is a real problem in, in, in due process. That's another thing, just to quickly add. There's a magnificent event 820-odd years ago called Magna Carta at Runnymede, where the, a shield was put between the sovereign and the people. And now, of course between the people and the state. Now, that shield says that they, the, the state must relate to us through a group of laws, and we must relate to the state through a group of laws and through each other, and the state can be the arbiter, it can set up courts. A fundamental aspect of that is evidence, which I just... Uh, illuminated its decline, and due process. Due process says that each side in the English system must be equally armed. What you've got, the prosecutor, the defence must have. If you've got two barristers, the defence has got two barristers. And the evidentiary basis for the prosecution is an evidentiary basis for the, for the defence. In the case of Julian Assange, uh, the, the due process has just collapsed them, I mean, and there's so many abuses. But one of them is this: that Julian was in a glass box in the court case, a three-week court case. Each in the glass box, it had slots this big. The floor of the glass box is raised about that high, above the well of the court. Julian has to get on his knees in the glass box and whisper through this bloody slot. The barrister on the other side, because Julian's in a raised floor, has to stand on her or his tippy, ooh, his tippy toes like that and listen. The, the, the prosecution are sitting in the well of the court this far away and they're hearing the, Julian's instructions to, to, uh, to his lawyers. They can pass notes and whisper in each other's ears. So the <coughs> defence says to the judge, this is no good, we want Julian in the well of the court. The judge says, well, it's not up to me. It's uh, up to the prison. OK. Because Julian is a prisoner. And uh, then uh, they apply to the governor of the prison. They say, oh, no, 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 it's not up to me. It's up to the people who transport Julian to the jail. They're in, once he goes out of the jail, they're in charge of Julian until he gets back in the jail. So this sort of bureaucratic uh, carousel goes round and round. They're clearly a, an abuse. Um, now, all of those circumstances apply to all of us. And I think, or I maintain, that... The movement worldwide that's uh, a rising tide, and as you can see, uh, presidents of countries now, Mexico, uh, Lula in, in uh, Brazil, the elected, president-elect of Brazil, they make statements in support of Julian. And finally, in Australia, the, the uh, Prime, Minister, Prime Minister makes a statement in support and, uh, and the uh, Foreign Minister makes representations. So I reckon that this uh, is a, a change in circumstance brought about by the vigour of those supporters worldwide. Yeah. Sorry about that. I just like to outline things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's mad. So do you, um, how much hope do you hold out with Albanese? Uh, I like him. I met him a couple of times. He, he, he's, uh, 
when you sit next to him and sit close, you know, we're sitting at lunch this far, um, <coughs> you know, to get a feel of the man because, you know, I believed at that time he'd be the next Prime Minister, to get a feel of the man and he felt all right. Just know. a decent bloke. Yeah, he felt decent and mm -hmm. steady. Uh, he listened <coughs> intently. He didn't try and dominate me at all, you know, like no argy bargy or no reaching over in front of me or, or no looking away while I was speaking, mm -hmm. you know, all of that sort of thing that people do to in order to indicate that they're better than you or whatever. Or you, no, that they're yeah. uncomfortable. Yeah. So he was all right, yeah. So I, I but he, had... he's just announced that he, you know, it's like enough is enough with children, so... Yeah, he said to bring bring closure to the mm. man. So, yeah. what do you think about that? Huh? What do you think about that? Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, so the same question came last night. If it was to be, if I thought that that meant closure, that the word closure meant that Julian go to the United States and spend 175 years in jail, mm. that would be closure. If I thought that, uh, I would be very upset. I would think that, you know, we've got a madman for a, a prime minister mm. who's willing to, for the convenience, just minor, minor <coughs> political <coughs> convenience, willing to sacrifice mm. uh, I couldn't get that a citizen. That he, Sorry? I didn't get that feeling. No, I didn't. <coughs> no. no, I think closure means that we will resolve. Bring him this. home. Yeah. So I'll stop dragging it out. Yeah, that's the feeling I got that he was saying. Mm. Uh, anyway, I found him decent, you know. Like, uh, mm. um, do you feel any concern with the fact that Albanese qualified that acceptance which a series of Australian Prime Ministers has resisted to bring him back home he did qualify that by saying, I don't agree with what he's done. Or it's not possible thing. for a Prime Minister <laughs> to say, in answer to your question, it's yeah. simply not possible for a Prime Minister to say, I agree right. with the release of 400,000 classified cables, 400,000 classified yeah. uh, files from the Iraq war, mm -hmm. 95,000 from the Afghan war, 250,000 cables from the cable set. And you expect the, the Prime Minister to say, well, you know, I encourage that sort of thing. It's just not possible. That's right. It's not, it, it would... It, it would uh, well, they're compromised. He, he they're would... Compromised. Uh, so place himself that's and his government mm. in a tenuous mm. that's circumstance. Mm. That's, that's understandable. Um, I'm also mm. interested in, in the way you said that, uh, well, Julian has become iconic. And there have been, you mentioned Caleri and the McBride trials, uh, the whistleblower uh, legislation, which We've yet to see whether it's going to be adequate, uh, whether it's going to be like the Whitlam Freedom of Information, which has been clawed back. But um, can you see that the recognition of Julian's position is very important to journalists and the uh, and the protection of whistleblowers, because basically that's what Julian was doing, protecting whistleblowers. Well, you know, there's not a journalist association in the world that hasn't made a declaration of support. Not one. Yeah, mm. um, yeah I, I, just, uh, I was looking at the credits at the end of the, uh, of the documentary and there's an immense number of respectable people, and you yourself have mentioned Doc Everett, uh, Whitlam, uh, all the organisations who have come out behind Julian. Um, and that's and, double since. Yeah, that, it's just, 
it's really uh, gobsmacking, really. It's hard to believe that the, this is still going on and it's still uh, pendiente. Um, it's still up in the air about whether Julian can come back home. Um, yeah, I, I don't think, you know, I don't think like that. I think that these things are a manifestation of what we want. And th that, you know, uh, so 29 cities fortnightly have events in Germany. There's 47,000 on the Facebook page, uh, the, the Assange Facebook page in Austria. There's two Facebook pages in France. One has 23,000 and the other 32,000. There's one in uh, Germany, 50,000. Um, it, it, uh, there's uh, an 800,000, 820,000 signatures on the Australian Assange support petition. <coughs> you know, it's every journalist association, every single parliament in the European theatre has an Assange cross-party group, even Luxembourg. Mm. Luxembourg, I mean, it's a very small place. Mm. Um, Greece is extraordinary. It has 300 parliamentarians, 90 of them, in the Assange cross-party group. Mm. There's a worldwide phenomena of support for the emblematic position yeah. of Julian. We're repulsed by the injustice mm. and hunger for the display of justice. Yeah. I, I think this is pretty good, don't you? Mm. Yes. Mm. 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 But I, I um, found that his uh, wife, what she said was really powerful. She alluded to all of that and then said, but he is a man mm. and he has a family. And I see the danger, you know, he is a martyr. He is our, our modern day martyr. I see a danger in that, and that martyrs don't survive. And he, he is a man with a family, with children. He made a, he did something a long time ago, but now let's get back to the fact that he is just a man. He's your son. Is somebody's husband, is somebody's father. In a, well, world, in a world of woe, saying that somebody's suffering, I don't think it'll get us anywhere. But saying that we want a circumstance of injustice rectified, and we feel it in our breast, in our hearts, and we hunger for justice in this matter, motivates vast numbers of peoples and societies. But to say, I suffer, or I am suffering, well, you know, join the human. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. We just suffer this place. Is a, is Just on a, a well, more positive uh, note that I heard towards the end of the documentary, you made a remark that really impressed me. You were saying uh, it's a work like building a house. I don't know if I got exactly right, but something like building a house for other people to move in and. Your mention of the international solidarity and support, uh, I think, is refers to that analogy. Mm. And I'm just thinking, well, WikiLeaks was really based on that kind of concept. Um, mm. Do you think that your do you think you influenced uh, no, not, <laughs> Julian not, not or not in <laughs> No, it's, it's a very similar concept. Uh, yeah, I mean, the concept's similar, but not in the slightest. No, he's no. his own man, and uh, he has... Uh, yeah, yeah. They're also held by Krypton and another company, I can't remember. 
really important. You, you can go there and look up what the American ambassador to Australia wrote about Anthony Albanese back in the day, or Bob mm. Carr. Mm. Um, I'm just wondering something that was touched on in the doco was the, the shifting perceptions of Julian and the media. Um, and that essentially it was you know, sort of being associated with some of the, you know, um, whatever, whatever come out with uh, Trump and you know the, the, the leaks of the Clinton's email and things like that. So there's been some like negative associations within the press. How do you feel that's, do you think that's changing? Well, you know, that was a deliberate program of the Clinton and the, and the Democratic Party to ruin Julian and ruin Russia. Uh, the testimony that Mueller got before Congress under oath from the head of CrowdStrike, who was uh, appointed by the DNC, the Democratic National Congress, Democratic National Committee, to investigate, <coughs> concluded that there was no indication of a, you call it, a, a movement into the computers to take into the Democratic, Democratic National Committee's computers to take out information. There's no indication whatsoever. And as the, the NSA listens to everything, records everything, um, if it had been correct, they could have released it. It just wasn't correct. It was a leak. Yeah. So they just lie to destroy Julian, pay Julian out for releasing the the, the files, they blame Julian for, it was convenient to blame Julian for her, Hillary losing the election, but she was just unelectable. I mean, fancy calling <laughs> half, the, half the electorate deplorable. Mm. Yeah. And expecting to win. Oh, the deplorable. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dear. Do you think the mood is shifting at all in the media? Sorry? Do you think that the mood is shifting at all? Yeah, yes, uh, last week uh, the five partners in the original distribution uh, published a letter uh, saying that they couldn't possibly support uh, the uh, application of espionage charges to Julian Assange. Um, the New York Times held back on the computer intrusion charges. Oh, it's all changed. They've all seen, you know, they've all seen the light and said, well, what happens to Julian? For example, it, 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 people use the example of China. If there's laws here, sorry, if there's laws in China that I break in Australia, China can rest, uh, uh, request my extradition. It's absurd. <laughs> sorry? I'm just laughing. <laughs> Nothing what I said is very funny tonight. I'm sorry. <laughs> but you're good. It's on yeah. quirky humor. <laughs> uh, so I've just got a question. Like you mentioned that there's 88% of Australians that, uh, that believe that uh, <coughs> should be released. Did you say, did you say that before? Yeah. yeah. So that's 88%. Yeah. So what's wrong with our society and our country that when that feeling pervades our, our, our community that we cannot get a result? Well, we've got a result, you know, but it's not an electric light switch, you know, it's a, a political social event and it has to permeate up through the institutions of state and a good thing about the institutions of state is that they don't flop around the place. The bad thing is about them is they don't change their mind readily. <coughs> and we have to change their mind. When you go into an institution, and there's a, a really interesting Polish theorist on that, 
when you go into an institution, you become part of the institution. If you don't become part of the institution, you get spat out. They don't want you no more. And the other thing is that an institution only chooses those who will blend with its ideology and circumstance and outlook. And if, like the uh, case, let's use this example just to make the point because it's really strong. If you have the KGB and the CIA and their competitors, they progressively, in competition with each other, choose more and more psychopathological people because they want to compete in the most ruthless manner they possibly can. So we have the, that, just to use that to illustrate the circumstance with institutions. The people have decided what they want. The parliamentarians, there's I think 50 in the cross-party group, in the Assange cross-party group, have decided what they want because one thing is that uh, their electoral circumstance depend upon it and the other thing is that there's a lot of quality people now in parliament after the, you know, I meet them and yeah, there's a lot of quality people there. Referential to that, is, um, is there, in your experience, has there been much sort of cross-bench cross support for the uh, mission being Julian back home? Is it bipartisan or yes, bipartisan? Yes, okay. There's Barnaby Joyce as Deputy Prime Minister uh, in, in uh, Washington. He was sick with COVID, so he couldn't make his meetings. But what he did at that time was make a statement saying he can't see that there's anything illegal of what Julian's done uh, and he ought to come home. He said that in Washington. Now, he was Deputy Prime Minister at that time. Okay. Julian Hill is a Labor Party person from Melbourne. He makes similar statements and he is on the Foreign Affairs Committee and the Intelligence Committee. Peter Khalil, who's chairman of the Intelligence Committee, is uh, in the Assange support group. Okay. Um, uh, anyway, I don't like to personalise. What took them so it. long? Huh? <laughs> I said, what took them so long? Or has it taken so long? Oh, I don't know, it's not long. It's a, I've been only working on this three years. I tried to describe to you that it's a worldwide phenomenon, you know, that all of these parliamentarians, thousands of them, you saw millions of people supporting, and we've only been working on it three years. And it's a measure of the power of the absolutely invisible, immense power of the American war machine that it is, that it's taken so long for people to rise up and start saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is wrong. I mean, people have been saying that what he did was, we all knew what he did back in 2006 was a really great thing. But some of us also thought, oh boy, the backwash from this is going to hurt and I, I, it, it, it surprised even me and I'm the worst America skeptic there is but it was yeah, it, it, that's why people shy away from things like this not just but any issue that highlights the injustice at the deepest and highest level politically and particularly with the America and with the multinational corporatocracy that we live with, it's something, it's almost something we can't, it's scary to talk about. Just to finish off, yeah. I'll try and, you know, in human affairs, things aren't easy and you know, they're not straight up and down. And, they're difficult and they require application of intelligence and patience, knowledge, and a sort of uh, work your way through things, feel. Mm. Okay, so the leaks. The leaks 
stopped a war. That's the cables, okay? In 2008, a group of American soldiers went into a house outside Baghdad and murdered everybody. The mum and the dad and the babies and the uncles, aunties, the boys and girls. Faced with this heinous, foul crime, they called in an airstrike and obliterated from the earth all memory, all trace of that little family in the house. This was reported in a cable by the United States Ambassador to the Department of Justice. Upon Chelsea Manning releasing to Julian the cables, WikiLeaks published them on their website, and those, that particular cable was read by the parliamentarians and people in Iraq in 2008. Iraq at that time was a wrecked country, completely wrecked, nothing there. Water supply destroyed, no electricity, depleted uranium used in, in Fallujah and other places, so mums, pregnant women, become mothers to become in horror of, of what they may give birth to. Okay, wrecked country. They read the cable and gathered up their courage and said to the United States and my country, to my shame, was an ally. We're not signing the Starters of Forces Agreement. You've got to go. And the Starters of Forces Agreement means that any soldier in, in the occupying forces is not under Iraqi laws. If you refuse to sign it, they fall under Iraqi laws. If they speed, they run over somebody. If they shoot somebody, then they fall under Iraqi laws, not their, what do they call them, conditions of engagement. They withdrew, so we brought the end of a war. Really important to keep it in mind. It brought yes. an end to a war. But ending a war and doing the things that Julian did comes at a cost. Mm, it's poking the beast. And all the human things come at cost. I don't know whether Julian's willing to pay the cost, but he has it's paid not fair, it. But he has been. He has paid the cost for the ending of that war. They're really important to remember. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing comes free in this game. Although, you know, I mean, the sun should... On the other hand, that's a bit bleak. So when On it comes out, yes. what happens when On it comes out? Hand, the sun shines its warmth on us every day and gives unstintingly. So what happens when he comes back to Australia? I don't know, you know, he, he's his own man, he'll go about life. No, 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 just like, he'll come and what are they doing? Are they sitting around going, should we let him go? Should we, what should we do? What's going to happen if we let him go? Do we all have to go to jail? We're going to make him the king of Nimbin. Make him the president of the Aquarius family. I've got a little confession to make for a cheerful ending. Yeah. But we've had quite a lot of fundraisers here back in the day, and I'm sure quite a few times we auctioned Julian's original roach he left behind in Rainbow Lane. <laughs> His teenage days. Anyway, it was quite a good fundraiser. <laughs> I didn't think you'd mind. I mean, no, no, that's... I was a bit worried telling you that. No, no, no. You've got to give us money. Yeah, yeah, you owe him all this money now. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Uh, um, Thanks, Hayden, John. Thanks, Hayden. to listen to me. Um, but the, the, just to answer your question, in Parliament, uh, speaking to people that I, parliamentarians that I admire, um, 
they said, you know, if he comes back, uh, you know, what will he do? In other words, will he make a fuss, you know, and all that sort of thing. Anyway, I rang up Julian and said, oh, they want you to go quiet for a bit. And he, he said, uh, um, you know, if they get me out of here, I'll be a, I'll take a vow of silence. You know, what's the name of the Carmelite? Now I'll be a Carmelite. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That'd be disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah. So he'll go quiet for a bit because he needs a bit. a bit of repair and yeah. convalescence. Well, I don't think that she needs DNA. Did he come back to Australia? Huh? Did he come back to Australia? Well, I mean, you know, he's got family here, Mm. got kids here, he's got kids over there, and I'm sick of travelling. If you want to pop in, it's better if he lives in Melbourne. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. A bit selfish. Have a holiday house in Nimbin. Huh? Holiday house in Nimbin. Uh, yeah, like Nimbin's all right. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with Nimbin? Nothing. Kaz said to say the cafe is still open, maybe, if somebody wants something. Well, let's go and have a go oh, and so yeah. Thanks very much for coming, everyone. Yeah. Thank you.